Welcome to this edition of Theological Journal's part uh, uh, on 1247 p.m. on 23 July. We're in the Hedgehog, which is a art journal on cultural studies, a note from the editor. What is important for us, asked a young Van Wick Brooks in 1918, then still Oops, let me switch glasses here. Still in the springtime of his long career as a historian and literary critic. The past is an inexhaustible storehouse of apt attitudes and adaptable ideals. It opens itself at the touch of desire. Brooks made an impassioned plea for a form of history bound not by inert facts and impersonal scholarship, but one driven by creative impulse to revive the spiritual welfare of the nation. Quote, for the spiritual past has no objective reality, he reminded. It yields only what we are able to see in it. What Brooks looked for and what his generation of young intellectuals and progressive historians said about writing was what he called the usable past. Brooks' search for the usable past in part was a rebuke of the arid historicism that had for decades prevailed throughout the transatlantic world of ideas. The master critic of that world was Frederick Nietzsche, whose 1874 essay, The Use and Abuse of History, provides the inspiration, not to mention the title, of this issue's theme. The essays therein various, variously critique one or more of the three types of historiography that the great German thinker described. The monumental, which celebrates the great deeds of the past as patriotic inspiration of the contemporary nation. The antiquarian, which looks back on the past with nostalgia and pious reverence. The critical, which seeks a break from the past by exposing its injustices, corruptions, and other failings. Each approach, in Nietzsche view, has its merits and shortcomings, but each can be used in service of renewal for the purpose of life today. An invitation to the uses of history, however, should be accompanied by a warning about the dangers of making history too immediately useful, which is to say too instrumental. By the time of the esteemed Southern historian Van Woodward took the lectern as president at the 1969 meeting of the American Historical Association, he could look back on more than two decades of almost uninterrupted growth in higher education and at a profession that had become complacent in its search for the usable past. Alarmed by what he called an instrumentalist view of historiography, then rising in popularity and using history as an instrument of political and social action, Woodward took aim at those who assumed it was the duty of the historian to discover, record, and celebrate certain American values. What Woodward had grown ambivalent about was the allure of presentism in the study of history, even if it was a feature of intellectuals' understandable desire to use their knowledge to change the world. History is far too important a thing to be reduced to a special possession of a class of experts, however well or ineptly they study it. Indeed, as the Hungarian-born historian John Lukacs points out in his magisterial historical consciousness on the remembered past, we are all historians now. Lukacs argued that a new form of modern thinking arose in the 19th century, one that sought to study everything through its historical development. So Jean-Baptiste Lamarck came to see biology 
not as something static, but as a pro product of evolutionary inheritance across the vast stretches of time. So too, John Henry Newman came to see Christian theology as not something believed everywhere, always, and by all, but as the product of dogmatic development. As Dutch historian John Huizinga put, put it in 1934, historical thinking has entered our very blood. Luke Getz called the modern form of thinking historical consciousness. We'll resume that as we pick up the Anglican Journal. And we're talking about Lambeth honoring three Canadians. Announcing the awards in March, the Archbishop of Canterbury's office cited McDonald's nurturing of Indigenous ministry as the Bishop of the Episcopal Church in the Diocese of Alaska, a post he held from 1997 to 2007. His selection is the first National Indigenous Bishop of the Anglican Church of Canada and his guiding role in the emergence of the self-determining Indigenous Church. It's an honor to receive the cross of St. Augustine, said MacDonald at the time. The greatest part of the honor is that the Archbishop of Canterbury has affirmed the work of our sacred circle and the elders of the sacred circle who've absolutely guided every aspect of my work and who each of them deserve this reward. Philip Poole, retired area bishop of York Credit Valley in the Diocese of Toronto, and Suzanne Lawson, who has held leadership positions at various levels of the church, also received the Lambeth Awards for outstanding leadership and support to the Compass Rose Society, Princess Basma Center, Jerusalem, and St. George's College, Jerusalem. A longtime member of the Compass Rose Society, which supports programs and ministries of the Archbishop of Canterbury, an Anglican consultative council, by networking, raising funds, and designating contributions for mission projects. Poole became its general secretary in 2021, served for a decade as international president. We'll pick that up next time as we shift to Trinity Journal on dating the Israelite calendar. Judges 19.9 uses the idiom Rafa Hayom Lauvar to express the fact that day has waned toward evening. The vast majority of translations understand the Lee preposition as indicating toward sunset, but not at sunset. The use in 2 Samuel 3.35, David regards the end of the day as sunset and evening as subsequent to sunset. The people tried to make David eat bread while it was still daytime. He swore an imprecatory oath. May God curse me if I taste bread or anything before the sun goes down. Earlier, when the death of Saul and his sons is reported to David and his men, they mourned, wept, and fasted until evening. Ad Erev, Joshua 8, 29, the phrase, Ukavo ha Shemesh is synonymous with the onset of evening. Joshua hanged the king of Ai on the tree until the time of evening. Ever Ad ate, and when the sun went down, Ukavo Shemesh. Joshua commanded and took the body down. A millennium and a half later, the sun's entry into the horizon still marked the end of the Jewish day. When the evening had come, Opsius de Genomenes, after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill. Mark 132. The slaying of the Paschal lamb, 
eve of the 14th versus mid-afternoon of Nissan 14. Since the Pashkal ham was killed at twilight, since the sunset precedes twilight, this indicates the original Passover was at the start of Aviv 14, not at the end of the day. Grace Amadon correctly states that the Old Testament fully sets forth 14 Nisan as the original Passover date upon which the lamb was sacrificed and eaten. The language of the Mosaic Passover, Exodus 12, 6, is unambiguous. Your lamb shall be unblemished male, a year old. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation is to kill it at twilight. The Hebrew preposition until means as far as or would be a poor and would be a poor choice of words if the intent were to keep the lamb through Nisan 14. When the writer of Exodus wishes to reference the evening at the end of Nisan 14, as in Exodus 12, 8, he uses kaved, is not used to express the terminus sad quem for eating the mesa, unleavened bread. Virtually all translations correctly render odd of Exodus 12, 6, until. The NIV has take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. We'll resume that later. As we turn to Anglican and Episcopal history, continuing the article on Michael Ramsey and Lambeth Conference, 1968. <clears throat> Once the conference was underway, its course was only the president's control to a limited extent. The 33 subcommittees deliberated, and their findings were filtered up through the sections into plenary sessions, after which different groups of bishops wrote their reports, which in turn came back to the plenary discussion. It is difficult to assess how Archbishop Ramsey shaped the resulting set of reports and resolutions from the chair although in general he intervened relatively little and less so than Fisher in the 1958 Lambeth Conference, which at least one bishop was known to have regretted. Some level of dissent was surely inevitable whenever he might, whatever he might have said. John McQuarrie, a visitor, recalled some disagreement with Ramsey's intervention in relation to intercommunion. One American bishop felt that he had been brusquely dealt with from the chair, but such moments were only as frequent as to be expected in any large and lengthy meeting, 1968. The two observers, Simpson and Story, thought Ramsey had retained the respect of all factions within the conference and had entered the conference and left it as a great leader of Anglicanism and Christendom. A writer in the Church Illustrated spoke of an infinite capacity to grasp the heart of opponents. Seemingly contradictory opinions reached his chair and somehow bounded back, transmuted. In the world of oratory, discussions and committees and type documents that Ramsey saw at Evanston in 1954, there had been no room left in which the real work could be done. Great matters of religion need thought, and thought requires spaces of quiet and leisure. And we continue on that. The turmoils of the 1960s. We turn now to the second article dealing with the Lambeth Conferences and International Relations, discussing the period between 1930 and 1948.
conventional diplomacy insisted on a division of domestic and foreign policy. What a government did in its own territory involved the sovereignty of that nation and could be barely touched by authorities abroad. But in the 1930s, Anglicans found this assumption impossible to maintain. Lang repudiated the advice he had solicited in 1933 from the British Foreign Officer Office and protested often against the persecution of Jews and Christians in the Third Reich. These actions were consistent with the resolutions of Lambeth Conferences who sought to identify the causes of war in domestic injustice as the hopes for peace were eroded by the assertions of dictatorships. Lang found a vigorous role in the diplomatic controversies of the years leading up to the outbreak of war in September 1939, striving to prevent the conflict by trying to build a common front with the Pope and other church leaders. In 1940, George Bell became a member of the Grotius Society. By this time, he was profoundly involved in German affairs, most significantly the German church struggle and the refugee crisis, which the Nazi persecution of the Jews provoked. Bell spoke on behalf of negotiations with Germany in 1940 and found little support. It was his view that war could only maintain Hitler in power, whereas in peace he would be more vulnerable to those who sought to depose him. For Bell, the war of 1939 to 1945 was not a war between nations, but a conflict of ideologies in which many Germans also sought to resist Nazism and end the destruction. But Bell was also adamant that the Allied powers must maintain the standards of international law. And in February 1944, he protested against the obliteration bombing of German cities in the House of Lords, citing the Hague Regulation of 1907 and the rules set down to govern aerial warfare in 1922 Washington Conference on the limitation of armaments. Archbishop William Temple disagreed with him. To what extent, if at all, did such insights and principles come to affect the debates of a new Lambeth Conference? We'll resume that later as we turn to table talk, into the word. We finished our introductory articles on difficult wor words in the Bible. Duties towards others. Westminster Shorter Catechism 3 summarizes the message of scripture by telling us that it principally teaches what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. This duty in turn is the moral law, which is summarized in the Ten Commandments. If we want to know what the Lord requires of his people, we look into the Ten Commandments. For they are the essential application of the great commands to love God and our neighbor. This month in our study of Exodus, we will continue our walk through the Ten Commandments completing our study of chapter 20 and looking at what God's word has to say about our duty toward our neighbor. Exodus 20 also features teaching on worship that helps us better understand the Lord, and we will consider those truths as well. And we'll move on to Exodus 21 and its teaching on slavery in ancient Israel and the basic principles of just restitution. Many of these laws do not apply in our context as written, but in them we can discern principles that govern God's people for all time. May the Lord bless us as we seek to fulfill our duty in him. The sanctity of marriage, Exodus 20, 14, you shall not commit adultery. 
we who live in the West are living in a day that can be described only as sexual anarchy. At times it seems as almost anything sexual is accepted in our culture as long as it involves only consenting adults. Much of this can be traced to a failure to rightly understand and apply the seventh commandment. As we see in today's passage, the seventh commandment forbids adultery. In the most narrow sense, the law tells married people that they may not engage in sexual activity with anyone other than their spouses. Moreover, in this narrow sense, we can see from our experience that human beings have not entirely forgotten the law of God written on their consciences. Although several forms of aberrant sexual behavior, fornication, pornography, homosexuality, and more, seem broadly acceptable to our society today, adultery in the sense of married people cheating on their spouses remains taboo in many places. Try as we might, we cannot totally ignore the law of God. John Calvin comments, although lewdness has everywhere been rampant in every age, still the opinion could never be utterly extinguished that fornication is a scandal and sin. By outlawing adultery, the seventh commandment establishes the principle that the only proper place for sexual activity is within the confines of marriage. This should not surprise us since it is reflected of broader theological realities. Marriage is the most intimate relationship that two human beings can experience. And sex in this context is a beautiful picture of the oneness achieved when a man and woman come together in rightly ordered matrimony. Thus marriage and the most intimate aspects are an earthly picture of the intimacy that believers enjoy with Christ. Our union with God through Christ is so close and intimate that the Lord chose marriage as an illustration of his bond with his people. And thus adultery is an illustration of the severity of idolatry. See Ezekiel 16. Just as idolatry is the most severe betrayal of creatures, especially professing believers, against their creator, adultery is perhaps the most severe betrayal of marital vows. By extension, that puts sexual sins in a special class of lawlessness, whose ramifications are often more extensive and damaging than those of other sins delighting in one's spouse. Proverbs 5, 18 and 19, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely dear, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. The Ten Commandments serve as the foundation for all the other laws that we find in Scripture as seen in their prominence in the Old Testament and repetition in the New. Consequently, each, consequently, each of the commandments of the Decalogue or Ten Commandments establishes a principle that is then applied to other situations. The extensive laws against incest, homosexuality, and bestiality and so forth that we find in places such as Leviticus 18 makes sense only in light of the fundamental axiom that the proper context for sexual behavior is the marital relationship between a husband and wife. All other sexual sins can become prevalent only if our confidence in the truth of the seventh commandment is weakened. In the seventh commandment, prohibition of adultery, we find the commendation of adultery's opposite, namely chastity. Today, people think chastity refers to complete absence from sexual activity in every context, 
that is not accurate. To live a chaste life is actually to view sex in its proper context and to live according to God's law in the area of human sexuality. Thus all people are called to chastity. It is just that chaste living looks different for married people than for unmarried. Married couples who enjoy sex only within the context of their marriage and single people who refrain from sexual activity are both following the principles of chastity given in scripture. The seventh commandment gives the positive duty of chastity and in the marriage relationship chastity includes enjoying sexual activity. Historic Protestantism especially has understood this well. Within the Reformed tradition, the Puritans, contrary to popular belief, are known for celebrating the sexual union of husband and wife. In doing so, they turn to passages such as Proverbs 5, where the instruction to the young man to avoid adultery includes the command to enjoy sex with his wife. The right response to temptation to sexual sin involves not only abstaining from forbidden sexual acts, but also encouraging marriage and channeling sexual desire towards one husband or wife. In fact, the Apostle Paul commands spouses to give one another their conjugal right. Sex is God's gift to provide intimacy and pleasure and to strengthen the union of husband and wife. So let us each delight in the wife or husband of our youth. We turn now to Standard Bearer and the article Pre-Synodical Sermon on 1 Corinthians 13. Give me a second here, if you would. What duties am I performing in my life without love? What am I simply doing out of a sense of duty without love for God or the ones I serve? What religious activities of prayer, of worship, of giving, of suffering for Christ am I busy with in an entirely selfish way, perhaps to be seen of men and with complete absence of love for others? I may have knowledge, I may have strong faith, I may even give my body to be burned, but without love, all this accomplishes nothing and has no value. And so also for the church, like Corinth, we may come behind in no gift, but without love, we are worthless. Love must be preeminent. We may have the best doctrinal statements, we may have members who know the scriptures and theology. We may have sound biblical teaching. We may have the most reverent and God-honoring worship. We may be busy in evangelism and mission. We may do all without love. Without love, there is no profit. We have failed. These words are confronting and convicting. Let all things be done with charity. When I think about how I am thankful for God's unfailing love toward me, I am glad that I know and experience the love of God through Jesus Christ. I appreciate that God sheds abroad this love in my heart through the Holy Spirit. I am thankful that this fruit of the Spirit is displayed by others toward me, and I pray that the love with which God has loved me may be evident in my attitudes, words, and behavior toward you. May God bless this word to our hearts. And then there's an editorial coming up, which we'll pick up next time. We turn again to Standard Bearer, <clears throat> the June issue, and the report of classes by Reverend Spont, the stated clerk. 
first PRC of Michigan Hall in Michigan hosted classes East in Redeemer Christian School Building in Zealand, Michigan. After Reverend Bill Langrick declared classes properly constituted, Reverend Dennis Lee assumed the chair and presided over the business meeting. Recognizing the importance of making decisions in harmony with scripture set forth in our Reformed Confessions, Classis requires every first-time delegate to sign the formula of subscription. Two delegates attended Classis for the first time and therefore signed the formula. Classis exercises mutual oversight by receiving answers from each member church to the question found in Article 41 of our church order. Reverend Lee asked these questions and received satisfactory answers from the delegates representing the 19 churches of Classis East. The stated clerk gave his report regarding his work over the last four months. The reporter for Classical Committee fell sick and was absent which means the committee will have an extended report at the end of September meeting of Classis East. Classis adopted pulpit supply schedule for two vacant congregations in the East, Grace PRC and Hudsonville PRC. At its March 2022 meeting, Classis West requested that Classis East assist in providing pulpit supply. In light of the positive change in circumstances, Classis West has one less vacancy due to Reverend Marcus's acceptance of the call to Peace PRC. In previous sessions, Classis East has appointed two special committees. One committee reported that it did not have a report on its mandate to propose changes to the rules of classes regarding the distribution of the agenda. Classes thanked the committee for its work so far, encouraged the committee to continue its work. Two consistories asked for the advice of classes before continuing the work of Christian discipline applied to members of their congregation. Classes advise one consistory to proceed to the announcement of the name of an impenitent confessing member per Article 76 and 77 of the church order. Classes advise the other consistory to proceed with the erasure of a baptized member who, though often admonished by the elders, continues to walk in sin. Classis approved the request of Carl Hawk to retire from active ministry after 43 years of faithful service. Classis marked the occasion by giving opportunity for several delegates to speak appropriate words about Reverend Hawk's service to the churches, singing the doxology and pausing from its business to allow the delegates to speak individually to Reverend Hawk and his wife. Mary. By an official decision, Classis East formally and sincerely expressed its deep appreciation and thanks for the 43 years of Reverend Hawk's humble and godly leadership. Contingent upon the approval of Synod 2022, Reverend Hawk's retirement will become official on September 1, 2022. The Catering Committee of First Holland PRC did an excellent job of taking care of the delegates during various breaks and lunch. The women well deserve the thanks expressed by the chairman, Reverend Lee. The expense of the meeting totaled $1,161. For its next meeting, classes will convene on September 14 at Byron Center, PRC. After the vote to adjourn the meeting, Reverend Lee closed with prayer. We thank God for the unity of our churches expressed in the meeting and pray for God's blessing on it. And next time we'll turn to news in the PRC. We turn to biblical Thika Sacra. Uh, 
In other words, following his baptism, talking about the Epiphany and Nativity. But before returning to John, Jesus turned 30 years of age. Close reading of John finds that seven days were fulfilled between Jesus' return to Bethabara and the wedding at Cana. It was at this wedding that Jesus performed his first miracle, turning water into wine and manifested his glory to the disciples. The wedding at Cana was traditionally marked by Epiphany, January 6th. Seven days prior to January 6th is December 31. Assuming the wedding at Cana fell on January 6th, December 31 is the date Jesus ostensibly returned to John at Bethabara, having already turned 30. This would be consistent with our discussion of Luke and his use of the Julian calendar to mark the limit of Jesus' 30th birthday. It seems to indicate that John follows a similar plan intentionally providing continuity with the synoptic gospels. After the wedding at Cana, Jesus, his disciples, and his mother and brothers went to Capernaum, where they remained not many days. This was followed by the first Passover, April 5, of Jesus' ministry. When he cleansed the temple for the first time, he would cleanse it a second time just before his crucifixion. Naturally, the historical accuracy of January 6th for the date of the wedding at Cana can be disputed. However, it is consistent with the overall chronology based on November 8 baptism and Passover the following year of April 5. But that Jesus had turned 30 at or near the end of his fast and temptation before he began making disciples and teaching is almost beyond question. Moreover, since these events appear to be crowded into the closing days of AD 29 and the beginning of AD 30, the early winter birth again appears to be historically validated. If this is correct, we may call Epiphanius as a witness. First, he was baptized on the 12th of the Egyptian month, Author, and the 6th before the Ides of November in the Roman calendar. In other words, he was baptized a full 60 days before the Epiphany, which is the day of his birth in the flesh, as the Gospel according to Luke testifies. Jesus began to be about 30 years old, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph. Actually, he was 29 years and 10 months old, 30 years old, but not quite when he came for his baptism. This is why it says he began to be about 30 years old. And he was sent into the wilderness. Those 40 days of temptation appear next and the slightly more than two weeks, two weeks and two days, which he spent after his return from the temptation returning to Galilee, that is, to Nazareth and its vicinity. And one day when he went to John, the day John said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. And the next day when John again stood and two of the disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked said, Behold the Christ, the Lamb of God. Then it says the two disciples heard him and followed Jesus. Epiphanius, I think the fourth century, as memory serves. And now for modern reformation, at the interview of Dr. Daniel, and the analysis of the Coptic church in Ethiopia uh, and the Ethiopic evangelicals. Interesting article. Dr. Daniel did her PhD on this subject, compare and contrast. Question, 
is an interview now. What positive examples and conversely warnings from experience can be learned as lessons from Ethiopian theology and history in regard to doctrinal controversies? Answer. The positive things we learn from mission history in Ethiopia is the act of indigenizing Christianity. Christian expressions are intertwined with the culture and they become part and parcel of one's authentic identity. Indigenous expressions of theology are preserved and passed on from generation to generation. We can also learn from maintaining monasteries as centers of learning, solitude, and prayer. What may serve as a warning is that revivals were not handled well in the history of the Church of Ethiopia. God's acts of awakening the church have been nearly quenched throughout our history. We are to work on listening to one another in true humility and acknowledging our common heritages. Question. What do you pray for the future might hold for evangelicalism and the EOC? Answer. To some extent, the EOC and evangelicals have a desire to work together for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is the internal tor turmoil they both faced. Both evangelicals and the Ethiopian Orthodox Church have experienced strong storms, which in the case of the Orthodox Church came near to splitting it. Evangelicals, on the other hand, are looking for a more stable and orderly church government. Thus, their admiration for the EOC's indigenous Christian values is growing, and disciplines such as fasting, order in worship, and spiritual mentorship are being sought after. The government is also playing a role in enforcing peace between religious bodies in the country. The government brought together major religious organizations and formed an inter- religious council. The council's delegates meet regularly and discuss issues related to tolerance. The council also holds workshops in district towns and creates awareness and promotes tolerance between adherents of different religions. It is my prayer that both use the council and other relevant platforms such as the Ethiopian Bible Society, for dialogue and grow to respect each other's traditions and yet acknowledge that they are fallible. We're to learn to speak with and not just about one another. We're to listen to one another as those who have more in common. I also believe that both Orthodox and Evangelicals need to deal with notorious preachers and teachers who diminish the centrality of Christ and the authority of Bi the Bible for their own personal agenda. We're going to be looking at an article on the prosperity gospel in Africa. Turn to Kelvin Theological Seminary uh, Journal, I should say, Gerard Sissar talking about the Beatitudes and he's been talking here about the merciful and those who hunger and thirst for righteousness and justice. And those who are merciful. They are filled with good things. Their needs are met. Isaiah also pairs together in a description of the time of God's favor and day of salvation. Saying to the prisoners, come out to those who are in darkness. Appear. They shall feed along the ways, and all the bare height shall be their pasture. They shall no longer hunger or thirst. In the Septuagint, the last line of verse 10 in Isaiah 49.10 reads, But the one who shows them mercy will comfort them. This mercy is the same word used to describe those who show mercy. The Lord is the one who shows mercy in Isaiah. Make sure you read Isaiah 13 to 23 here, Gerard. He 
he shows mercy to some, but not to all. In Matthew, Jesus leads the way as the one who is hungry, feeding first the 5,000, then the 4,000, and has compassion on those who are tormented. 936, the sick and the hungry, 1532. In fact, it is his compassion that both motivated him to do the ministry to the needy and motivated the commissioning of the disciples to do ministry. In the story of the unmerciful servant, it was compassion or pity that moved the master to have mercy on his servant, 1827. In the case of the servant who had been forgiven, there was a noticeable lack of compassion in him and no act of mercy. Jesus also repeats the prophetic focus on mercy over sacrifice which seems to be representative of personal piety in Matthew. It is no surprise then that it is the disciples as agents of the king who are called to be merciful to those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. These hungry and thirsty shall be filled by the mercies of God distributed through his servants. God demands that the devout have a corresponding attitude to those who are in need. The hungry show up elsewhere in Matthew, but when the disciples are hungry on the Sabbath, they begin to pick great heads of grain. Strangely, the Pharisees are there. One would not usually expect to find Pharisees in a Galilean wheat field on the Sabbath. This was hardly their usual habitat habitat and makes sense only if they were looking for grounds to accuse the disciples they may well have been looking to accuse them or the hungry poor generally who are making their way to the synagogue either way this narrative exposes the pharisees who had failed to show mercy their failure to show mercy gets to the heart of the Pharisaic problem from Matthew's perspective of neglecting mercy. We turn to Westminster Theological Journal. I've got a comment here from a student of Turin. Upon finishing up with Witsius, whom do you suggest reading? Well, certainly Turin and Witsius is good. I have Bovin, Burkov, and Brockel sitting on the shelf. Would like to hear your suggestion. Well, certainly Burkhoff and Bob Inc. I've only read uh, a couple of his volumes, and it's been so long ago that I don't quite remember. And I've not read Wilhelm Brockel, but I have at it. <laughs> I have it all three of them. I'm working through Burkhoff now. And the systematic queue is full. I'm going to do redo Kelvin on the Institutes. It's been a while. And I'm not sure where else I'm going to go after that. But certainly, Bovink, Brockle, um, and Burkhoff. And all I know, the other one, after the Institutes, I'm going to retour tour it and tour it in his three volume set. That's coming up. That's going to take me a year or two to finish those three volumes. Slow reading now. Turn to Westminster Theological Journal, waiting here, the spring edition, talking about doctoral dissertations uh, that were done at Westminster. And here's one, a marriage of true minds to a consistently reformed use of the scholastic method. This may bear a uh, turret and student on your inquiry. Let's see. This thesis considers the problem of the impact of the post-fall intellect, important question, upon the possibility of true communion between the believer and unbeliever, particularly as it relates to the reformed use of the scholastic method. This historical and apologetical study concludes that a consistently reformed use of the scholastic method requires the grounding assumptions of a Vantillian epistemological framework. 
chapter one accepts the research which indicates the scholastic method is principally just that, a method. Further, it accepts the idea that common notions, an idea important to medieval and post-Reformation scholastics, may offer a possible way for true communication to obtain between believer and unbeliever. In light of man's post-fall plight, the question I then seek to answer is, are common notions and epistemologically reliable grounding for the scholastic method to effect, effectually communicate content between believer and unbeliever? Chapter 2 addresses Thomas Aquinas' view of the post-fall intellect. I argue that Thomas maintains the sin of ignorance as located in the intellect, and he holds that the sin of ignorance willfully neglects the truth which common notions are supposed to communicate. Thomas, however, does not make it clear whether the sin of ignorance truly remains within the intellect or with whether the will with its sin of malice intrudes upon the intellect causing an intellect to neglect truth. Thus, I argue that Thomas's way of framing post-fall human epistemology does not satisfactorily answer the question. This is true in part because of Thomas's lack of clarity regarding how sin remains located in the intellect without the intrusion of the will. In chapter 3, I turn to John Owen to see if and how he is able to alleviate this tension as he seeks to provide clarity concerning how the post-fall intellect is in itself hostile towards truth and toward God himself. Owen explains that the post-fall intellect assents to the truth of facts but rejects the spiritual reality of those facts. This rejection of the spiritual reality of facts creates an epistemological wedge between the believer and unbeliever, and we are left with the question, how can believer and unbeliever engage in true communication if the unbeliever's mind is hostile towards spiritual reality of facts? Chapters 4 and 5 examine Cornelius Van Til's answer to this narrow question as he lays out his own conception of epistemological depravity and the common ground which makes true communication between believer and unbeliever possible. His epistemological framework is shown to be necessary for consistently reformed use of any engagement between believer and unbeliever. In chapter 6, I concentrate specifically on the scholastic method as an effective method of engagement between believer and unbeliever. Here I answer the question, what might the reformed use of a scholastic method look like if it were grounded in Van Til's epistemological framework? It is demonstrated that a consistently reformed use of the scholastic method requires grounding assumptions as those in Van Til's epistemological framework. We'll bring this session to a close. We'll resume shortly, maybe a half an hour or so. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed. Good to see you, student of Turret. And a great question. If you get any developments on your thoughts in that, please post them. We love hearing about reformed thinking. Godspeed.